Aotearoa to State is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union. Kia ora Aotearoa, welcome to Aotearoa Fifth Estate, where we rack the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Joining us tonight to discuss climate change in studio, former co-leader of the Green Party and current leader of Greenpeace, Russell Norman. Uh, on the phone, Labour Party spokesperson on climate change, Dr Megan Woods, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we're still trying to get him from Geneva at the moment. Uh, author on the Royal Society of New Zealand Climate Report published last week, Professor Jim Renwick, but we are having difficulties with Geneva. Thank you for joining us, panel. Remember, viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts for tonight's show off watianews.com, the dailyblog.nz platforms, and you can email us, watia5e at watia603am.co.nz, the longest email address in the Southern Hemisphere. In the weekend, Climate Change Minister Paula Bennett signed New Zealand up to the new Climate Change Agreement at the United Nations. But will a non-binding list of hopes be enough to tackle the reality of climate change? And does the little done in Paris suggest our political system simply can't cope with the enormity of change required to adapt to a rapidly warming world. Uh, Russell, Paula Bennett may as well be declaring peace in our time with this treaty, isn't she? It's just a nice feeling wish list. How will anything we've signed lead to actual reduction in pollution rates? Well, I mean, nothing signed will do that. It's just a piece of paper um, and it's not binding. Uh, so, you know, what matters at the end of the day are actual actions uh, to cut emissions. Uh, so real climate action requires us to, you know, close down Huntley coal-fired power stations. Yep. Um, it requires us to invest in sustainable transport yep. instead of high carbon transport. And it requires us to reduce our emissions coming out of the agricultural sector. Um, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, until there's a commitment to actually take those actions, uh, we're not going to see a big cut in emissions. Does it suggest the government aren't taking climate change seriously if Paula Bennett is the minister? I mean, she's a minister with no scientific or environmental background, yet she's been appointed climate change minister. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I mean, I don't think you have to be an expert in the field yeah. um, to be a good minister. I mean, if you're committed to taking action on climate change, um, you don't have to be an expert on climate change issues to be a good minister okay. of climate change. Um, I think, you know, the, the real test is, uh, does she take action? Does she introduce policies that yeah. would actually cut emissions? That's the test. It's not whether she's a, an expert on climate change or not. Did you have a chance to see her 10 minute interview on Q&A in the weekend? Uh, no, I didn't. It was a train wreck. Right. She wasn't able to, beyond three-minute point, be able to give any answer that wasn't just bureau speak. Right. So it doesn't, because Jack Tam was really trying to push her on, well, what exactly are you going to do? The, cl the closure at Huntley, that, that's not even on the agenda, it seems to be, from this government. So how are they actually going to? Let's take them at their word. They, they, they want to do something about it. What are they actually going to do? Well, I mean, I think all we've got so far um, is that they're going to make the emissions trading scheme slightly less hopeless uh, than it is. I yeah, mean, that's yeah. kind of that's. Were you, much were you surprised by the Morgan report on that? Uh, the Gareth no, Morgan report? No, I wasn't. I mean, I think what's really interesting about that report is um, so you know, there's all these fraudulent carbon yeah, yeah, credits, right, yeah, yeah. that have come out of the Ukraine, and, and you know, they are literally completely fraudulent. Right. Um, and New Zealand, I mean, as Paula Bennett has now said, was well aware that they were fraudulent for some time, and yet. What's been happening is that uh, to, in order to um, uh, meet my commitments, a company's commitments under yeah, the emissions yeah. trading scheme, I've been able to purchase these credits that's right, that's right. uh, at a few cents per tonne, hand them over to the New Zealand government to meet my commitments yeah, under yeah. the emissions trading scheme. And then the New Zealand government now has a very big supply of these fraudulent credits. And in order for New Zealand to meet its international commitments between now and 2020, it's yep. going to surrender these fraudulent um, carbon credits to uh, the international trading system um, in order to demonstrate that New Zealand is somehow compliant with its international commitments. It Wouldn't a carbon tax have been a hell of a <laughs> lot easier? Wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, a carbon tax would be much more effective. Um, but, but I think it is interesting that Paula, when she was interviewed about it, she said, well, that happened in the past. But yeah. actually, what the point is, is that actually, no, it's going to happen in the next four years. The New Zealand government will be submitting these fraudulent credits um, to, to cover its greenhouse emissions. Uh, so but we, we know they're fraudulent. But we know they're fraudulent. <laughs> 
<laughs> How does that work? <laughs> because they're fraudulent, but they're, they're legal. Um, so, so New Zealand, the New Zealand government found a, a legal avenue to, to through the system whereby these fraudulent credits were manufactured in the Ukraine. Yeah. Um, companies in New Zealand bought them, handed them over to the New Zealand government, which they were allowed to do under yep, the ETS. Yep, the New Zealand yep, government's yep. now sitting on millions of them and intends to use them in order to prove that it's a good international citizen over the next four years. Oh, that's just, that does it, my, it, it really does my head and it, it does... Is, uh, Kind of amazing. It's like you know, like you know, it's, you know, this is about life and death. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. This is this, is, mean, this is the biggest. This yeah. is the biggest issue yeah. confronting our civilization, yeah. and the government's trying to pass off fraudulent um, it's, it's, um, credits that that, that, that aren't going to actually do what they're supposed to do. And, and you look at the Great Barrier Reef, and you go, on the one hand, you have the people who are trying to increase emissions, and what that means is death. Yes. And, and grey, right, and black and white. That is their that yeah, is their, their yeah. imaginary future. Is the, yeah. is the is the dead Great Barrier Reef? Is the future they envisage for our planet? And over here we have a we could have a life. We could have biodiversity. We could have colour. We could have a planet full of diversity of life if we're just willing to cut our emissions. And how does the New Zealand government bring these two things together? Yeah, by buying fraudulent Ukrainian carbon credits uh, and handing them it, over. It, it I mean, really, it is incredible. It, it, yeah, yeah, it's it, it's insane. Uh, Dr. Wood. Can politicians be part of the solution here? We are risking runaway climate change and political parties seem to still be umming and ahhing about what to do. Have corporate interests shut down the political process? Well, actually, I think if you have a look at what's happening internationally, and certainly at Paris, that the, that the business meetings were actually pushing governments for stronger action on climate change. And I think that we're seeing that here in New Zealand as well, that actually businesses rightly are seeing that some of, the, some of the moves that they can make to reduce their emissions are actually a way to take costs out of their business. Yeah. You, re you reduce the amount of energy you're using, you reduce some of your costs. So I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I, I think you make a really good point in terms of about the role of politicians. And what we're seeing in other countries where we actually are seeing some action on climate change is that you've taken this, the, the detail about exactly how you do some of this stuff out of the hands of politicians. And Labor's really keen on having an independent body that oversees this, but it's yeah. one of the problems we have. I mean, all the lists that Russell went through, absolutely correct, but we have no organisation in New Zealand that can integrate all these ways in which we need to take action on climate change. And we want to see an independent climate commission, much like they have in the UK, who's tasked with carbon budgeting and actually coming up with a plan. It's like anyone, we all know if we need to save some money, we need to sit down and write a budget and realise how we're going to do it, not just a wish and a prayer and hope we, a whole lot of money tumbles into our bank account. So for us, that's really critical, that we depoliticise this and that we actually get some good planning around this with clear plans and clear pathways of how we're going to do it. If the TPPA becomes ratified, how will Labour pass environmental legislation that doesn't open us up to legal battles with big oil corporations? And this certainly is a concern that has been raised around the ability for states to do that. And it certainly was something that a number of um, our smaller neighbours are concerned around too in terms of international agreements and the, the fear that they will be sued if they try to take action. So that's something that um, as we go through the submission process on the TPP that we're having to look really closely at is the ability for New Zealand to, to be master of its destiny over the changes that it needs to be, that need to be made. The, um, the Royal Society of New Zealand report, we don't have Professor Rinwick, un unfortunately, but uh, I'll put, um, put one of the questions we had for him to you, uh, uh, Dr Wood. Um, the Royal Society of New Zealand report on climate change, it painted a pretty grim picture uh, of, of, of New Zealand's future. But do you think the numbers the IPCC, which they've based it on, are strong enough? The IPCC don't include methane release from Siberia, the oceans or any dramatic melting from Antarctica and we're seeing those events take place now in real time. Isn't it possible actually that we've underestimated all of this and the worst case scenario may be kicking off? Well, uh, and I think we're seeing that particularly in our region, that climate change isn't a theory or academic in the Pacific, that you've got villages that are having to move. At the moment, my colleague, um, Sue William Theo, has just been on a bit of a That's tour right. around the Pacific, visiting yeah. some of these these villages and talking to some of the people that are affected firsthand and are, are debating whether or not um, it's real. But I think the IPCC has taken a, um, a, a conservative and considered approach to the science, that it's really here to be the organisation that um, has um, steered the world towards believing the science 
and I think it's done a really good job in that. I mean, I, I don't actually find too many people being outward climate deniers these days. So they've been reasonably conservative. I don't know if you'd agree with me on that, Russell, but they've been reasonably conservative in their science and have taken um, taken a, a very academic approach to it and have taken what they know they can get broad support for to prove the case that we do have human-induced climate change in our, on our planet. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Megan. If, if they don't include the methane release from Siberia or from the oceans, or, or they didn't even have the Antarctic, um, they, 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 weren't, they weren't including that because they didn't think that, was, that would ever collapse. If they're not including those, how solid are the numbers? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the issue was that they, w with some of them, they decided that it was very difficult to model. So some of the ice dynamics in Antarctica were very difficult yeah. to model. So they, you know, uh, overtly excluded them from the sea level rise. Yep. Um, so some of the later stuff that's come out, um, and there's just very recent, the Jim Hansen stuff's been peer-reviewed now. I mean, uh, and, you know, they're talking about much more significant sea level rise. The Victoria University stuff that um, Professor Renwick was involved in and yeah. others. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we're looking at pretty... Uh, you know, the worst-case scenario is becoming a possibility now, isn't it? Oh, but there's no question. I mean, we're... <laughs> I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the numbers of where it's going, we, we're definitely there. I mean, what, what's really interesting, um, it's not really interesting, it's terrifying, but is, you know, like, what do tipping points look like from yeah, behind? Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and when you're in the middle of a tipping point, you don't really know. You can't be sure. So we've had 11 record months in a row. Um, and so, you know, including the hottest month ever recorded in February. Um, so, you know, it is, we could look back on this period and go, that's what a tipping point looks like as right. the system moves to a new equilibrium point, which is much hotter. Yep, yep. Um, but uh, we don't really know right at this moment what it, whether that's what we're in the middle of. But there's no question that we obviously need to cut emissions dramatically. How, how, how far away do you think the scientific consensus is from the political consensus now? Is it, is, is it still... Uh, uh, yeah, Megan, if you want to jump in on that first. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think that it's now becoming less and less acceptable uh, politically to deny that climate change is happening. And actually, not that long ago in our parliament that that was a position that people could take and did take. And I think that's becoming far less of a credible position. I think what we have now is the about whether or not there's going to be credible action plans around what we're going to do. And that's really where we have to get hard about this and that we have to put in place credible action plans because it's one thing wringing your hands and saying this is really bad and signing international agreements and saying that as you say that um, peace in our time that the world has found a solution if you're not going to put in place the actual things that have to, have to happen in your own economy and the Paris Agreement was always going to be about um, ambition and aspiration that was set at a very high level but always dependent on the actions of individual countries to go back and actually fulfil their, their their targets that they set and there's going to be real reputational damage out there for the countries that don't so the political consensus and the political need for this to happen in terms of our place in the world is just going to grow day by day. Russell on Paul Henry uh, this morning I, I, I watched the show so you don't have to he had a panel discussion on climate change wow. and the panel wow. was Christine Rankin and Don Brash <laughs> now now unsurprisingly <laughs> Sound of one hand clapping. Unsurprisingly, they didn't believe that, 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 that climate change was made by human pollution. How much responsibility? Because if you have a look at the numbers, New Zealand has one of the highest levels of climate deniers in a developed world. We've got about 16% of our population who don't believe that climate change has anything to do with human beings. It's something to do with the sun. Uh, how much does the media need to take on board in terms of responsibility? for giving a lot of quack science platform on this? Well, it's pretty variable, obviously. It depends on the different kind of players. So obviously Paul and doing that is, is just ridiculous. And Paul should be ashamed of himself um, more than usual. I mean, but, you know, Paul doing that is, that's just crazy. And, and I think that's a bit of an outlier. There's not many media organisations that would have two climate deniers um, on at the same time these days. I think that what, what kind of is interesting, though, is like going back to your first question about where does the consensus lie yeah. in the political world versus the scientific world. But it's important to kind of think about what the science world offers. It, it's kind of like it just says it's a set of facts. It says if you do X, then Y. Yep. Um, and so you produce lots of greenhouse emissions, then we're going to flood Mission Bay. Now, the question is, is that a bad thing? Um, does anyone care? Yep. Um, and, and so, you know, th that's a value judgment. 
Right. Um, and so, you know, and, and a scientist isn't going to say it's a bad thing to flood Mission Bay. They're going to say, well, if you, you know, it's just going to flood. There you go. Yeah. Um, and so that's where the world of politics and values and all of society comes in. And we've got to say, well, are we happy to have this event happen to us? Uh, and so far, um, basically, government's got away with kind of not making the connections apparent enough. Yeah. Um, and so they just... So, like, you know, we had the oil conference in Auckland. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah which yeah, is a yeah. classic example. On the one hand, the government says, yes, we accept the science around climate change. Okay, so that's, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to drill for more oil. <laughs> that <laughs> completely... <laughs> <laughs> those two, those two things cannot be the same, right? Yeah. They, they cannot sit by side by well, side. Well, the only way that they can is if you say we don't care if Kohimara Kohim and Mission Bay goes underwater, yeah, um, and all these other dramatic climate change events happen. But they're not really arguing that; they're just hoping that people will not make the connection between an oil conference and climate change, right? And certainly, the government themselves are not making that connection. And I reckon that's where the rubber hits the road for the yeah. political system. It's like, are you willing to say no more oil drilling? Yeah. Because the science says that we have to keep. 80% of the fossil fuel reserves in the ground right now, yep. aside from discovering new ones, yep. if we want to have a stable climate. Yeah. Um, so you can't have new oil drilling, you can't have new coal mining. Yeah. Um, and so that's where the rubber really hits the road is when you come down do, to hard do, questions like that. Russell, do you think that climate change, is it more an un, is, is, is it an unsettled scientific theory or is it actually now just a clash of cultures? People who drive around in very large cars, does guzzling down their diesel who have benefited culturally and financially from a consumer culture that doesn't care about environmentalism those people don't want to admit people like you are right that's got nothing to do with science they don't they don't want to have to accept that that the green movement and the values the green movement are, are, are asking and and the, the the commitments they're asking for are too much for them to have to consider is it a culture clash now i mean uh, you, d d I think that's a little strong. The reason I'd say that is that I think there's been a lot of movement. A lot of people have moved a long way. Like yep. when you look at pub public opinion polls, yes, there's still a lot of people in denial, but most people have moved and kind of get it. Um, I, I think, you know, you could argue there's a bigger issue for human civilization. We see ourselves as separate from the natural world, not yep. part of it, yep. and that's an yep. ongoing problem. It applies to climate change. It applies to biodiversity loss and all sorts of yep. things. Yep. Uh, so, you know, you've got to challenge those. Uh, but, you know, this is a big change which our society has to make. It's been built on cheap fossil fuels. All of a sudden we have to move away from them pretty quickly. Yep. It's a big change. Um, inevitably, there's a lot of vested interests who don't want to change, and that's both in our minds as yep. well as in our economic system. So, yeah, it's a big change. Dr. Wood, how do you convince voters to take climate change seriously? Well, I think one of the, the key things that we've got to do is start talking about the tangible effects of climate change. I mean, I see people's eyes glaze over every time you pull out percentages and um, how many tonnes of carbon, that it doesn't win the hearts and minds. And one of the things I really noted at one of the ESAC events I went to yesterday, that um, the Navy made reference to climate but at climate change and the address that it gave in terms of what its role and what it does these days, uh, responding to climate to climate change, which I thought wasn't something I could have even imagined two or three years ago happening in an ANZAC address like that. So I think we've got to make this really real. One of the examples I often talk when I w talk about when I'm talking to people is about the potential loss of jobs that occur if we don't take climate action. 232 um, relatively low-skilled, low-paid workers in my electorate lost their jobs last year because yep. the water in Northland was too warm to That's grow right. the mussel spread that they were shucking in Christchurch. And I think if we can get this down to the everyday for people and make it about things that matter in their very life, we can take the conversation a whole lot more broadly than middle-class dinner tables, and I think that's really important. So for, for us, that we see climate change very much as a part of our future of work program, yes. that we've got to be preparing people for the change in our economy that is coming, and if we sit back and just wait that to, for that to happen, a shock will occur rather than a transition, and we know that it's workers that will get thrown on the scrap heap. Russell, you've been inside the political machine and, and now you're, you're outside the political machine. You'll have an excellent idea of this. Can you really make change on climate change inside the political process or is it too broken? Do, do you need to force the buggers to do it outside? Well, I mean, you know, my, my, my view of history is that pretty much every progressive change that's ever happened um, has been driven by 
uh, people power, essentially. Yep. yep. Political parties have responded to that, but usually lead, almost always leadership comes from outside the political system. Right. Some political parties respond earlier than others, and yeah. some provide more leadership than others. Um, I mean, you think about the first Labor government, you know, which but but there was huge pressure from outside yes, the Labor Party. Yes, that's right. um, and so, you know, in Greenpeace, our strategy is we think people power is going to make the difference on this. So Absolutely. at that oil conference, yep. we got hundreds of people engaged in non-violent civil disobedience, yep. blocking all the entrances to the conference, disrupting it. We jumped on the government's oil research vessel, yep. the Tungaroa, there'll be more to come. I just think that it's going to take people power intervening on this thing. Yep. And that will be part of building political pressure on the political parties um, yeah, yeah. when people get more serious about it. And, and I think that's what it's going to take. It, wh where, yeah, where's the tipping sorry. point? Oh, yeah, yeah, Russ, uh, sorry, sorry Megan, go for it. Yep. yep. That was very much in evidence at the climate talks in Paris, that it, as many members of civil society and other organisations were there, as there were negotiators in rooms hammering out the deal, that it very much was the pressure that was coming from, from the environmental NGOs, but also businesses and unions and a whole bunch of people that sit outside of that formal state, um, state environment. But I think cities are going to be really important to to this as well, that there's an idea that um, most of our emissions are produced in cities and cities might respond much faster than states, so I think that's also going to be really critical. Uh, Doc Dr Wood, are, are the changes to the economy needed to tackle climate change simply too radical for a political party to implement? I mean, could you, could you realistically pull back on the dairy interests and the farming industry in this country and force them force them to, to, to lower their emissions? Well, there's been a mechanism sitting there that, that could have been doing this for, for the last few years, and that was bringing agriculture into the ETS. But one of, one of the reasons why the ETS isn't working is because we're leaving a huge part of our economy out and one of the highest emitting parts of our economy out, that that needed to be pulled in. And that wasn't about punishing past behaviours. That was about having a lever to influence future land use decisions. Yeah. And we've got to make those hard decisions, and we, we've got to... We've got to for, for us, the bottom line is that agriculture simply can't continue to sit outside of the system that is about reducing, well, the, the tool we have for reducing emissions in this country. So at what point do you think that we need to actually state a limit to the amounts of herds? I mean, that's what this comes down to. It's, it's the intensification that's the problem, isn't it? At, at what point are we going to say to a farmer, you can't have more than X amount of cows per hectare? Well, if you, if you bring agriculture into the ETS and they need to make decisions based on the real cost yep. of that form of farming um, versus other land uses, um, whether that be forestry or cropping or other animals that could be used, I mean, there's a then people are making real decisions on the costs. And one of the things that we can do, there's a variety of things that farmers could be doing on farm, and we can see that there's some really good farming practices that are both sustainable and about reducing emissions that we could be incentivising. So perhaps we, we start talking about clean rivers rather yep. than reducing nitrous oxide, because actually one of the impacts of using less, um, put a, using less nitrates will be the byproduct of that, of course, is nitrous oxide, so we'll have cleaner rivers, and that's a much more tangible thing for people to, to um, latch onto and something that appeals to farmers, because again, it's a cost out to them. So we've got to be using all the tools that are there, and people need to make decisions based on the real cost of their activities. Russell, you made real inroads with the farming uh uh, community. They, there are clearly people there who want to change and they want to provide a sustainable product and get a higher price for that product. But you've also got a lot of corporate farming interests at the moment who are just profit driven and it's bottom line and it's as many cows crammed into a space as possible. How do you counter that influence politically? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the really important things in what Megan just said is it's about land use. Mm. It's not about are you for or against dairy. Yep. It's about saying there's just like land has multiple uses. Yeah. Um, and land that is currently under dairy 10 years ago, a lot of it was under forest. Forest, right. right. Yeah, yep. um, and they're just responding to price signals effectively. Sure. About sure. dairy price signals, carbon price signals, water price signals, a yep. combination. And so when you change the kind of the economic and regulatory framework in which they work, the nice thing about a corporation 
is that, well, they're just there to make money at the end of the day. And if you change the cost structure around yep. them, then they'll respond to it. Because so what it's, are still, they it's still about putting in the right dynamics for the market to let the market respond. It's part of it. So part of it is price signal. Part of it is going to be regulation. We yep. need strong regulation around water quality in particular will make a very significant difference. We may well need strong regulation around intensification um, because the intensive model is so destructive in so many ways. So, I mean, I do think that if you get the right kind of regulatory and economic signals in place, yep. then you will change behaviours. And, and it's about land use change. That's what it's about. Russell, at no time in our planet's four billion year history have we artificially accelerated the planet's heat in the manner we have since the Industrial Revolution. I've read a lot of scientists out there who are looking at this, and they are not sure what happens next, because we're in uncharted scientific territory. Um, what is it going to take to make people go, oh, we've got a problem here? Well, I mean, so the first thing is, if you look at the paleoclimate, so the ancient climate, I mean, the planet has been warmer. Yep, uh, and yep, so we yep. do through, know through natural, naturally yeah, yeah, occurring, right, through naturally yep. occurring thing. And yep. so we do know what happens. <laughs> yeah, uh, the planet, the oceans rise. <laughs> yeah, um, and lots of things go extinct, um, and all of our cities, our major cities, will be flooded. Yeah, um, and we will just, you know, fundamentally undermine civilization as we built it over the last twelve thousand years. Um, so we've got a pretty good idea about what, what's going to happen because we know what happened in the past. Um, what will it take for people to change? Well, I mean, I think we're already seeing pretty significant change. I yep. mean, we've now had, what is it, a couple of years of flat greenhouse emissions. We're seeing uh, coal companies, Peabody Coal went bankrupt, a fantastic yep, yep, thing. Yep, yep, yep. Um, the world's biggest coal miner went belly up. It's just fantastic outcome. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think whichever, you know, that, that it is happening. It's just we need it to happen faster. Yeah. And we need it to happen stronger, and we need New Zealand to stop being a laggard. Um, you know, New Zealand should be a leader instead of a laggard in this. Um, but it is happening. It's just we need it to happen real fast. Quick now. question from someone in Wellington, Dan, uh, David in Wellington. Uh, we know the cost of emissions. If, if uh, we know the cost if emissions aren't reduced, but what's the cost to implement Russell Norman's strategy? What is the cost? The cost is. There, there is no saving the cost. planet. I mean, you know, like talk about your options, right? So, you know, in terms of renewable energy, we've yep. already got to eighty percent. Like, and we didn't even subsidise the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cutting, closing down Huntley would let us get to ninety yes. percent. I mean, at no cost. I mean, basically no cost because Huntley's so bloody expensive yes, to run. Yes, yes, yes. Um, if you're looking at transport infrastructure, like we're spending a fortune on new motorways if we yes. invest in sustainable transport. Billions. If you replace fossil fuel use, like say oil for transport with electricity, if you electrified the transport, you would have fantastic economic benefits for New Zealand because you don't have to buy it from offshore. So that's great for the current account deficit. If you look at agriculture, it's about land use change. We've changed land use in the past. It'll change again. Uh, we have to wrap the show. Before we go, we'll do a final word with our panelists what will force new zealand to take climate change seriously dr wood depoliticization of the issue and yep. actually getting some lasting political consensus but that's there to change a government also russell people power it's going to take people out in the streets people getting active on this issue putting pressure on governments it's the one powerful progressive force that's always happened in our history is the one thing that's going to be required again. Thank you panellists and to my final word yes uh, thank you to my final word um, last week a huge trove of documents were released in America showing oil companies were aware their product could dangerously warm the planet as far back as 1968. Their decision was to mimic the same tactics the tobacco lobby used when confronted by research showing cigarettes cause cancer, which was the claim the science wasn't settled. We have been conned into thinking the science that connects our pollution to a dangerously warming planet is somehow still up for debate. It isn't. And the sooner we front up to that reality, the sooner we can generate the political will that forces real change. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, Fano, for watching. We'll join you again tomorrow night, 7 p.m. for Wātea Fifth Estate. Kia ora and good night. Wātea Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union.